Um, I am delighted to introduce uh, Professor Mikhail Holchepek from the Czech Republic, whose talk is entitled Lipidomic Profiling of Human Serum Enables Detection of Pancreatic Cancer. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Valerie O'Donnell. I'm based at Cardiff University in the UK. As usual, our webinar is being recorded. It's going to be uploaded onto LipidMap's website and the YouTube channel in the next 48 hours. Uh, the webinar is going to be around 45 minutes, along with about 10 minutes at the end for questions. So ideally, if you have questions during the talk, please post them in the chat or in the Q&A, either one, um, because what I'm going to do at the end is ask you to unmute yourself and then you can speak to Mikhail yourself directly. So please use the function and uh, we will uh, take questions at the end. So now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Professor Mikhail Holchepek. Um, who obtained his PhD on the connection of LCNMS at the Department of Analytical Chemistry, University of Pardubice in the Czech Republic. After this, he continued his research at the Department of Analytical Chemistry, where he was first appointed Associate Professor and then full Professor of Analytical Chemistry in 2013. His research is focused on the use of mass spectrometry in qualitative and quantitative analysis of organic and bioorganic compounds, most particularly lipids, and recently he specialized in developing a com the combination of mass spectrometry with either ultra high performance liquid chromatography or ultra high performance supercritical fluid chromatography, um, enabling the development of validated analytical methods for high throughput analysis of as many lipids as possible. And of course, as cohort lipidomics becomes more and more popular and you know, more and more used uh, in the biomedical field, work like this from Mikkel's group to develop these really key assays is so important and essential to the field of lipidomics. Um, a key application of these methods in Mikkel's lab is the analysis of biological samples in cancer patients to identify dysregulated lipids and their use for early cancer detection uh, using multivariate analysis. So in relation to this, today he's going to talk to us about pancreatic cancer, I think judging from the title of his talk. And this was the focus of a recent paper published in Nature Communications, and I'll post a link to this um, in the chat uh, as the talk starts. So it's sobering to think that pancreatic cancer has the worst prognosis amongst all cancers. And in Mikkel's recent study, he, with his colleagues, found that mass spec analysis of a range of serum lipids allowed stratification of cancer at early stages with a diagnostic specificity of over 90%. And this study included three phases of biomarker discovery research and found dysregulation of several different lipid species from sphingomyelin, ceramides, and lysopc. So it, it will be fascinating to hear this, this talk today. Um, Nickel has also conducted research during several collaborative stays in France, the US, and Norway. He's an editor of Trends in Analytical Chemistry and a member of the editorial boards of Analytical and Bioanalytical Chemistry and Lipids. He's a vice president of the International Lipidomic Society and obtained several scientific awards, including being on the power list of 100 most influential people in the analytical scientist sciences over a number of years. He's co-authored over 148 peer-reviewed publications and co-edited a large number of books on analytical chemistry, particularly focusing on mass spectrometry. And I'm delighted to introduce him today. Um, and thank you, Mikhail. I will hand over to you now for your talk. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction and also for the opportunity uh, to present here. It's uh, really my pleasure uh, just to see so many people attending and maybe others can see it later. Today, I would like to talk uh, about our work on the lipidomic quantitation with the application for cancer research, which is based on our paper. Uh, you can see uh, the link here. It was published uh, this January in Nature Communications and it's focused on the lipidomic profiling of human serum, which may enable the early detection of pancreatic cancer. So uh, you may see that there are quite many co-authors, not only from my own group, but also cooperators from Germany, Singapore, and a couple of other countries, as you will see later on. Uh, so First, the just brief introduction, uh, what is uh, what uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma is uh, like. Uh, this is unfortunately the cancer disease with the, the most lethal character because the five-year survival rates are uh, the lowest from all existing cancers. It's below 10% and for uh, late stages, it's like below 3%. So it's really important just to detect this disease as early as possible. But unfortunately, there are absolutely no symptoms for early stages. So when you have really uh, some starting healthy problems, then it's too late. 
So for the diagnosis, the conventional imaging tools are used like computer tomography, magnetic resonance imaging, or angle uh, sonography. And for final uh, confirmation of the diagnosis, the invasive tissue biopsy may be used as well. There is just one existing uh, so-called oncomarker. Uh, this is glycoprotein called CA199, which is very good for the monitoring of treatment progress. But unfortunately, the sensitivity is too low, especially for early stages. So this is not applicable for early cancer detection. Therefore, our goal is to develop some uh, early diagnosis methodology using non-invasive and high throughput methodology. And it means uh, the lipidomic analysis of human serum or plasma, what I'm going to present today. First few remarks about the use of lipidomic analysis in high throughput uh, clinical setups. So we know that uh, lipid dysregulations are associated with various human diseases and disorders. Therefore, uh, uh, our group and other groups are trying to develop some clinical tests for detection of such diseases. Here uh, in this uh, figure, you may see a simplified scheme of such possible tests that you start with blood collection, then you isolate plasma or serum, and then perform the screening test based on the lipidomic analysis. And then the test may be uh, negative in majority of cases. So then there should be a repetition in defined uh, period of time. Or in case of positive result, then the follow-up should be the medical diagnosis using uh, the, uh, the conventional medical procedures like imaging tools and finally the confirmation of diagnosis and treatment at early stage with much better survivor prognosis. But there are of course some serious challenges to overcome. The first one is biological uh, variability. It is a very serious problem for all studies that people are not identical uh, and unlike for example mice experiments you have really huge variability to overcome, and this is pretty difficult, but you will see that it's possible. Then pre-analytics, starting from sample collection, storage, transportation, processing, and so on. So this stuff, which is not often uh, paid enough attention, but you re really need to be accurate because mistakes here cannot be repaired later on. We have performed a lot of intra and interlaboratory tests of reproducibility, robustness. We have done very careful analytical validation. We will do clinical validation, and I will show you a few examples of how we do it and how we use quality control samples. This slide is uh, pretty trivial, well, well known from all biological textbooks uh, that we see these omic cascades starting from genome which represents a genotype. That means what may happen in the future depending on the information written there up to the final step, which is metabolome. And one subgroup is lipidome with something up to 100,000 species. And this metabolome is closest to the function. It's called uh, with other parameters as phenotype. And it shows us what is happening in the organism right now or in the very near future. So when we uh, target at biomarker discovery, definitely this is the right, uh, right area to go. You probably know these basic definitions of lipidomics, that this is qualitative and quantitative analysis of so-called all lipids, that is lipidome in biological systems at given time. But in fact, uh, you may quantify only uh, lipids which you are capable to detect and quantify by your analytical methodology. So analytical chemistry is really very important because uh, th this is the definition of how many lipids can be reported and monitored uh, in particular diseases. So um, this generic overview of our workflow is also relatively standard that we start from the collection of biological samples like body fluids, tissues, cell lines, or whatever. Then uh, extremely important step is the addition of exogenous internal standards, preferably isotopically labeled. This is really very important. Then uh, we do sample preparation, a liquid liquid extraction. We prefer methodologies based on chloroform, like Blydire or folk extractions. 
And that step number three is uh, the major part of everything. It's mass spectrometric analysis, uh, typically coupled with some separation technologies, such as supercritical fluid chromatography, preferred by uh, my group, or liquid chromatography. Eventually, you may use also approaches without chromatographic separation, so-called shotgun approaches with low or high resolution or multi, multi or imaging technology. Then the data uh, have to be processed. For data processing, we have developed our own uh, software script, which is freely available. It is called LipidQuant, uh, which is freely available. And very early, we will release the version number two. And finally, step number five uh, is uh, for uh, determination of healthy and disease subject. This is statistical analysis using various tools of multi data analysis possibilities. Uh, I will show you later many examples of this. Here, uh, I'm starting from the use of internal standard. Uh, you may see this relatively extensive uh, list of internal standards used in my group for uh, five uh, lipid categories. And for uh, each individual lipid class, the recommendation is to use at least one internal standard for each lipid class to be quantified, but preferably more than one. So here you see sterols, papiacils, glycerolipids, phospholipids, and sphingolipids. And these internal standards must be added before any sample handling, uh, just to monitor all errors introduced during the process. And uh, internal standard and analytes from the same lipid class should coelute or at least elute as close as possible to keep the same matrix, uh, matrix effects. Otherwise, you may have troubles with quantitation. And preferably, we should use isotopically labeled internal standards. As you can see, uh, deuterated standards highlighted in red color. Eventually, uh, in some cases, you may use also shorter fatty acids in green or longer uh, shown here, or eventually odd carbon fatty acids. But in all cases, you need to verify that this mass is not interfering uh, with your analyte and that uh, internal standard is a really exogenous one. After selection of internal standards, method development, and method optimization, the next step of any quantitative assay using mass spectrometer must be method validation in line uh, with these rules for biomedical validations presented by FDA, EMA, or other agencies. So if you go to the literature, you will see that these documents are quite complex, not so easy to read and follow, but I can guarantee you that it's really important to adopt it because the validation may allow you to discover that you have hidden problems with your methodology. So you should really go step by step and determine all these parameters. Now, I'm not going uh, to go into details because it may take a couple of hours and it would be really boring for the lecture. If you are interested, please uh, just see our paper and then you will see everything described step by step. Here, I have only single slide just the example how to determine the selectivity and carryover effect. So the first example is selectivity, which is actually the test uh, whether your internal standard is suitable for quantitation and whether there are no system interferences. So first, uh, we inject the blank matrix. You see it here uh, in uh, red color. And for the position of internal standard, in this case, deuterated sphingomyelin, there is absolutely nothing. After this, you inject the matrix spiked after extraction at a low concentration level. And here you see the signal. And the rule is uh, that the signal for blank must be lower than 20% of lower limit of quantitation. Here is absolutely nothing, so it's fulfilled. And vice versa, for carryover effect, uh, you measure the memory effects from previous injections. So you have to start with the calibration point spike before extraction at a high concentration level. So you see it here. And after this, you inject solvent blank. And here again, there is absolutely zero. It means that these validation criteria were passed. And you need to do it step by step for all the parameters. 
Uh, quality control samples are very important. Uh, we use uh, the series of different quality controls, uh, NIST, uh, SRM plasma, pool sample. It means that uh, before the study, we prepare the pool sample from healthy controls and uh, patients. And then this sample is injected regularly after like 20 to 40 injections to verify that everything is running well with the system. And then here uh, you may see that we monitor the signal, for example, for one selected internal standard, uh, PC28 uh, with zero double bond. And after like 1000 of injections, you see the gradual decrease of intensity. So uh, this is for peak area, but when you switch uh, to the concentration using the suitable second internal standard, then you see that it's pretty stable. The second example in green color is shown for some endogenous lipid to be quantified. Here you see the certain loss of intensity over the time, but here it's normalized using the internal standard and then the data should be appearing. Uh, QC sample, uh, as I told you, is injected regularly. Here you may see on these yellow points that we have certain, um, certain drift. Unfortunately, it should be one point, but it's almost never like this. Almost in every case, you have small drift. And this shows the quality, uh, how uh, your methodology is developed. This case is pretty satisfactory, I would say. Um, we like uh, really very much uh, the coupling of ultra high performance supercritical fluid chromatography with mass spectrometry because it's extremely robust. Uh, this slide is shown here to illustrate uh, the robustness uh, of methodology because we have injected the identical samples, identical extracts, but using a different sequence template after a couple of months. Uh, here, this graph is principal component analysis. It means uh, non-supervised statistical tool. And this is the first sequence and second sequence. And it was the set of uh, something like 500 samples of cancer patients and healthy controls, cancer in red color, uh, controls in blue. And you may see that if we highlight some outliers, that in both cases, they are absolutely in the same position. Uh, so the concentrations, the models, and the outliers are identical in both cases, which really confirms the robustness of methodology over a couple of months which is extremely important for the clinical studies and future uh, clinical sc screening tests. Uh, unfortunately, we were not satisfied with the available commercial software tools for the data processing, because in all cases, we faced uh, severe problems, and therefore we have decided to develop our own software tool, which is called LipidQuant version one. And this tool is used especially for quantitation, in lipid class separation approaches. So if you use lipid species approach, then this is not ap applicable. But if you use helix or shotgun or SFC approaches, then uh, you may like uh, to download from the website for free and follow the instructions and just use it for the quantitation, including uh, the right use of internal standards for individual classes, including uh, the de-isotoping, it means the uh, type two isotopic effect subtraction. And in the version number two, we will also implement, uh, it's already done, the isotopic effect of type one. Now a few slides on the stability uh, of the lipidome. We have measured the set of 99 samples of healthy volunteers over the period of one year uh, in time zero, after half of year and after one year. And then we have measured RSD for individual lipid species from these classes. So you may see that if you focus on uh, non-polar lipid classes like TG, DG, MG, and cholesterol esters, we see a lot of red color. It means the variation over 50%, which is definitely not nice uh, if you head towards the biomarker discovery because it's really huge fluctuation over the year, which depends on the nutrition, physical activity and other parameters uh, which are difficult to define. If you look for more polylipid classes, phospholipids and sphingolipids, 
Now the green color is prevailing, which shows that the variations are below 10 or below 20%, which is relatively acceptable. If you look for QC samples, it's always below 10 or in many cases below 5%, which is pretty good. And here is the list of quantified uh, lipids in this uh, published study. Uh, we have done also numerous other tests just to decide whether to use uh, plasma or serum or which type of vials to use for plasma collection, whether EDTA, heparin. We have compared the collection now and later, and uh, all these correlations are described in detail in this paper. And again, just one single conclusion that in most cases, we have very nice RSDs, except of these TG, DG, and MG, where variations are slightly higher. So when you see some paper where these lipid classes are considered as biomarkers, just be really very careful and uh, rather uh, before doing such conclusion to uh, double check that you are really right. And now the explanation uh, why we prefer to use lipid class separation for the quantitation over lipid species separation. Uh, here you see the advantages and uh, limitations of both approaches. Uh, for lipid class, uh, we may use either helic methodology, SFC, and of course, uh, any approaches without chromatographic separation, like shotgun MS, because uh, here you have the coalition of internal standards with analytes from the same lipid class. Therefore, uh, uh, the identical uh, matrix effect is guaranteed, and the quantitation is really robust. And also, you have very easy identification, and you may automate the uh, data processing very easily. But the drawback is uh, that the information is just limited to summary formula only with the carbon number and double bond number, but you miss isomeric separation, Unlike, which is uh, uh, vice versa, the main advantage of lipid species separation using reverse phase chromatography, 2D chromatography, or eventually ion mobility. Because here you may separate many isomers, which results in the detection of about two to three times more species compared to lipid class. But the quantitation is much more difficult. You need more internal standard and also identification and data processing. It's much slower and much more laborious. Now I, I would like to show you an uh, example of our helix separation. Here you see about seven minutes separation with nice resolution of phospholipid and sphingolipid classes within a relatively short time shown on the example uh, of the internal standard mixture. But unfortunately, uh, the non polylipid classes are polluting in the dead volume of the system, and some ionic classes like sulfatides are eluting even before the dead volume due to uh, repulsion forces. So for this reason, we prefer to use ultra-high performance supercritical fluid chromatography, where you may see first a little bit shorter analysis time below five minutes, but a very nice separation and excellent sensitivity of all non-polar lipid classes, because SFC is primarily designed for non-polar compounds, because the polarity of uh, the mobile phase, typically supercritical carbon dioxide, is very close to the polarity of hexane, which is totally non-polar, and therefore non-polar compounds are well suited here. But you may see also nice separation of polar lipid classes due to the addition of polar modifier during the gradient. Some real data for uh, human plasma samples so you see the example from our real work that we have analyzed the study of 1,000 samples, which is typical medium-sized study. And these samples uh, were extracted by two people within seven days, measured within nine days, and data processing was finished within five working days. So in total, we are capable to process this uh, within like one month. Uh, if you use multiplexing, and uh, the work of two people in parallel, then we may do it uh, in one system within uh, two times per month. It means the uh, capacity of 2,000 samples per month. So you see 155 incursions per day, 
and uh, slightly less than 200 quantified lipid species. In case of helichromatography, it is only slightly slower and slightly less, but almost comparable, I would say. Okay, um, now uh, I would like to continue with this uh, pancreatic cancer study. As this was uh, stated already during the introduction, uh, this study was split into three phases. Phase one called discovery, phase two qualification, and phase three verification. Uh, phase one started with a sample collection at just one clinic, resulting in 364 samples. It was measured only in my laboratory using three different methods, SFC, shotgun, lower SMS, and moldy ionization. Then uh, the reviewers in Nature Communications claimed that the study is in two preliminary stage and ask for independent verification from other laboratories. Therefore, we have invited colleagues from Germany and Singapore and transferred samples there and used a little bit extended uh, sample set, over 500 samples collected again at one clinic, measured in three laboratories using four different methods that we have added also a high resolution shotgun approach. And everything shown further in a red color will be pancreatic cancer samples, in blue healthy controls, and here uh, pancreatic, the pancreatitis is the chronic non-malignant disease of pancreas, which is typically changed later on into pancreatic cancer. But uh, pancreatitis is not yet malignant disease. Uh, so for us, it's the key positive control. And finally, phase three verification. We obtained samples from four different collection sites, four different clinics, everything measured only in our laboratory using FFCMS. So now I'm going to show you the data. First, uh, in the discovery phase, you see the data for FFCMS. Uh, you see these numbers separated for males and females, because if we split the models, then we see a small increase of accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. It's um, in the range of like 2 to 5%, but it's still very fit. In all cases, we use uh, both training set and validation set. And for validation set, the samples are blinded to analytical chemists, so we can verify uh, the real performance of methodology to avoid some artificial models. So first, uh, always principal component analysis. It means non-supervised statistical tool. So QC samples are in small area, which is fine. And we have here only very, very minor group resolution, uh, which is not so perfect. But when we switch to supervised orthogonal partial least square uh, discriminant analysis, then you see the perfect resolution of uh, healthy controls and pancreatic cancer samples. Here you see different colors for different cancer stages. Yellow is early stage D1, orange D2, and so on. Uh, then you see the data uh, uh, for the same phase using the shotgun approach. So here uh, you see slightly better separation in PCA, but then in OPLs as uh, the 100% uh, perfect uh, resolution of both groups for males and slightly worse for females. This is quite generic rule that for males, it's always better. For females, probably the, the hormone cycle may slightly complicate the situation. So these models are always slightly worse. Okay, now we continue uh, to the phase number two with additional uh, two invited laboratories, Gerhard Liebisch from Germany, Markus Zwenk. By the way, uh, to transport all the samples uh, to Singapore, it was a pretty difficult logistic task and not so, not so cheap and not so simple, honestly. And finally, the samples were captured on the airport and we sent uh, like 10 kilograms of dry ice and it was almost melted, but finally we succeeded. And I am capable to present you the data uh, from these uh, measurements as well. As you can see here, for this extended data set, 
first we started uh, in our laboratory. Uh, so you see the training set and the validation set. Roughly two thirds or three quarters of samples are used for training of the model. And then uh, these number of samples are used as blinded samples with unknown classification. And in all cases, you see separately for males and females results for training and validation. So you see sensitivities, specificities, and accuracies. Of course, for validation set, it's always slightly worse, but the difference is not so significant. If your model is artificial and overfitted, then it will fall down completely and you will fail. So uh, now I switch uh, to results from the laboratory number two. It was measured by uh, Gerhard Liebig group using shotgun with a low resolution triple quad analyzer or orbit uh, FTMS. And here you see example for males and all data are shown here that uh, also in this case, we are mostly over 90%. And finally, the uh, reverse phase uh, LCMS used in Singapore. You may remember that I have advocated for the use of uh, lipid uh, class separation, but in Singapore they use lipid species separation, but they are experienced and they optimized and validated the methodology well. So in such case, uh, even reverse space methodology can also provide the data which is fully comparable with others if you really pay the attention. So it's impossible to say that reverse space chromatography cannot be used for quantitation, but you need a little bit more expertise. You see that these models are really excellent and fully comparable. But the next slide is my favorite one because I show here the comparison of molar concentrations for most uh, dysregulated uh, lipid species uh, in pancreatic cancer and other cancers as well. So what we observe that very long sphingomyelins with one double bond, example here shown for Corti 1 1, and the same for very long ceramides with one double bond, the same example shown here, and lysophosphatidylcholine 18 2. In all these cases, uh, the concentrations uh, in cancer patients are reduced. So you see the down regulation. And these molar concentrations for four different methodologies measured by three different labs without any prerequisites. Individual labs use their own methodologies, own internal standards, and own quantitation approaches. So it was absolutely no harmonization in this study, and we already have this correlation. Uh, I should uh, emphasize that we used uh, the normalization using NIST uh, standard plasma, but for lipid class separations, we have this correlation even before normalization. Maybe you prefer ROC curves uh, shown here. It means the dependence of sensitivity and specificity and use again separately for training and validation sets for all four methodologies. And except of one uh, example here, in all cases, we are over 0.9 and mostly even over 0.99. So it's quite good. And now I am moving to the phase number three, the verification that uh, if we include uh, different variables, uh, variables that the methodology will still work. We have extended data set to 832 samples collected at four different clinics in Czech Republic. So here you, you can see overview of uh, control samples, uh, cancer samples, and pancreatitis. And here you see what we have done and included in single model. We have samples before and after chemotherapy or palliative therapy. We have samples before and after surgery with pancreatitis, with or without diabetes, so obesity, uh, and simply all possible diversity, but it still works. We are still over 90%. So at the moment, I can say that uh, this is really valid and every experienced lipidemic laboratory can reproduce this and obtain the same result. One uh, important remark, um, just for the future screening, it's extremely important to look at early stages. T1 in yellow color, or T2 in orange. 
because honestly, you cannot help people at late stages. So if you see all these yellow or orange points, they are not at the edge, so they are not failing. It is extremely important information for us. Um, now, uh, I will show the way how to even improve the methodology. At the beginning, I told you about this Oncomarker CA99. And the advantage of this Oncomarker is that it has quite high specificity. So the cutoff value is 37. But if the value is like over 100, this is almost for sure cancer. So there are almost no mistakes. So it means the specificity is very high. But unfortunately, the sensitivity is not good enough for early stages. Therefore, this oncomarker cannot be used for cancer screening because for many early stage patients, this value is not yet increased. So this is not applicable. Our lipidomic methodology is excellent because of very high sensitivity, uh, mainly for early stages. It's not failing at all. So if we combine, as shown here, uh, so here you see in a red color sensitivity, blue is specificity. So for CA99, specificity absolutely excellent and sensitivity not good enough. Our lipidomic approach, both is relatively good, but when we combine with CA99, then we improve both parameters slightly. So you can see it on this curve here that for CA99, this red curve is not good enough. Then the violet one is uh, so-called cancer seek methodology, which is based on proteins, including T191 and some uh, cell-free DNA. And then blue one is our lipidomic approach. And finally, the best one, combination of uh, lipidomic profiling plus CA199. So then we are really over 95% in all cases, as you may see on these models, including CA199. Uh, the reviewers asked us that we should prove uh, that the methodology is good enough also for early stage. So we have separated the data set for uh, this early stage T1, T2 in this uh, light uh, red color, and also late stage uh, T3, T4 in this brown color. And you see for these selected uh, dysregulated lipids that we don't see any, uh, any increase of concentration for, uh, for early stages. And in some cases, it's even better for early stage. So we are not afraid. And we have even models for early stage uh, when, when we have uh, selected the same number of uh, early stages and cancer patients and the model was over 95%. Um, in green, uh, you see also pancreatitis samples, which are much closer to healthy controls. But I should emphasize that the number of samples is not sufficient and need to be verified in the clinical uh, validation. A frequent question from uh, clinicians is whether we can use it for the treatment monitoring. The answer is simple and is negative. We cannot. Because you see here that even after treatment or surgery, if we collect samples a couple of weeks or months later, we don't see any change of lipidomic profile. And for example, if you look here, these green samples are before surgery and these orange ones are after surgery, and it's even worse. So we don't see the possibility to use it for treatment monitoring only for early diagnosis. The reason behind this uh, is unknown, but if you know uh, the very low survival rate for this cancer type, it means that these patients are almost never cured. So maybe it's related to this fact that uh, even without the tumor, they are not really cured and uh, the, the tumor uh, will return back later on. So big results in this uh, set statistic. Finally, we have tried also to check uh, survival prognosis using Kaplan-Meier plots. So first, uh, you see CA99, which is really very good for this purpose, because high value of uh, CA99 results in a very bad prognosis. Uh, so we have checked first the effect of gender, non-significant effect, but unfortunately, the effect of treatment is also non-significant for survival, which is very bad. 
for some lipids, uh, we see significance, but if we compare it, uh, these values with CA99, so then we are worse, so we don't see the reason to suggest the replacement, and we will really focus on early cancer diagnosis. So finally, I'm moving towards the clinical uh, validation, which is the last step of this research. And now we are preparing the concept in cooperation with all key stakeholders, medical societies, and experienced clinicians, because the output uh, of this uh, clinical validation will have really key importance for future adoption or rejection of the methodology by clinicians. So there are questions like how many samples, this has to be determined in cooperation with statisticians. And based on this, we have to decide uh, whether we are capable to collect enough within clinics or whether we need to invite also clinics abroad. And finally, whether to use it only for pancreatic cancer or preferably multi-cancer study. But uh, you may ask why multi-cancer because you have not shown the reason so far. So the explanation is shown here. The same or very similar dysregulation pattern what we observe for pancreatic cancer is observed for other cancer types. Here, uh, I show the results for human plasma from kidney, prostate, and breast cancers. Uh, and you see that it's uh, relatively well resolved from uh, healthy controls. It's slightly worse compared to pancreatic cancer, but still we are somewhere like 80, 90% of accuracy. Uh, unfortunately, these numbers of healthy controls and cancer patients is uh, not balanced, which of course results in worse quality of models. If this is balanced, it may be slightly better. And here you see the differences of concentrations for these uh, two most significantly dysregulated lipids for individual cancer types. So you see that all of them are really downregulated. You may notice this step here, uh, I should explain that for pancreatic cancer, we use serum samples and for all others, plasma samples. But lipid concentrations in serum are about 20, 30% higher. So this comparison is not absolutely, absolutely fair and correct. So this results in this small step here, but, but we know that uh, the direction of this regulation is identical. And here you see uh, arrow seekers and sensitivities and specificities. And if you are interested uh, in this paper published in scientific reports, there are details for individual cancer types. You see here results for kidney cancer, prostate uh, cancer, but only for males in this case, breast cancer for females. Uh, by the way, these cancer types uh, exist also for males, but the number of samples was very low. Okay, uh, and uh, what, is, uh, what is the next step? So it's my pleasure to tell you that this month, uh, the joint venture of my University of Pardubice and Fonds company uh, established uh, this uh, lipidomic diagnostic of cancer screening, uh, screening spin-off called Lipidica which is based on these two patents. One is granted, the second one is pending. And now we are just uh, going to equip laboratories, install instrumentation during the next month and hire employees. And then the first task is the clinical validation. So you see here three milestones. We start with the methodological transfer from my laboratory to Lipidica, then the clinical validation and verification of utility, and finally, uh, we hope that within uh, less than five years, we may start uh, the cancer screening for defined high-risk groups, not for population screening. This does not make sense because the, the sample could be too many and positive rates too low. So for high-risk groups, uh, we plan to establish this cancer screening. So if I recall back, these individual four phases in biomarker research so just for fun, uh, first, uh, I have seen the data measured by, by my colleague, Dennis Muller, using SFC in 2017, just after organization of HPLC 2017 Prague conference for more than 1,000 people. So in September, I saw the data. Next year, we have prepared the patent, and we are now. 
So we will see in the future what will be instead of these question marks and whether we are capable just to pass it and go further. So this is my final slide. Just to summarize everything that I showed you, the high throughput lipidomic quantitation approach based on lipid class separation, coupled with high resolution uh, mass spectrometry workflows. And uh, this approach was applied for early cancer screening. At the moment, we have measured more than like 2,000 samples uh, from five cancer types, or even more at the moment. And our current throughput is over 20,000 objects per year per system with two analytical chemists. So uh, finally, uh, I should tell you that uh, unfortunately, I am not the person sitting by the instrument anymore, not even interpreting data. Uh, so this is done by my younger and really skillful colleagues. So you can see key people from my group at the moment, starting from uh, Dennis Wolrab, who did a lot of work uh, on this cancer research, my deputy and key person in the group, Robert Tirasco, then uh, Micha Kokolouškova, who also contributed significantly, and now she's working in Singapore. Uh, Ondra Peterka, who is responsible for the transfer uh, to Lipidica, and our student Kuba, Suska, and other people not in this slide. But not only my group, but many other people from different countries and clinicians contributed to the study, so I would like to thank them all. So if you are uh, interested uh, in this research, what we are doing, I can tell you the final claim that now we just open the positions for PhD and postdoc. So if you are interested just to move uh, for next uh, one or more years to Czech Republic, you are definitely welcome. Don't hesitate and write me. Thank you very much for your attention and I am ready to answer Thank questions. You. Thank you. That was that was excellent. Um, I have a load of questions, actually, and while I, I'll start with asking my questions and while I'm doing that, I'd encourage the audience. We've got quite a lot of people here, so get thinking and start posting some questions. Great. Actually, there is one, but I said I'm going to start, so I'll take the first one. So it was really interesting to see the um, analytes that you came up with, Mikhail, there. So th they're from three different lipid categories, and I wondered if that was a surprise that they were completely different you know obviously two of them you know 41 one but um you know lipids do tend to behave in groups to some extent did you uh, see any of that going on as well uh, absolutely you are absolutely right i showed just examples here but for sphingomyelins i could show the same graphs for 41 39 40 42 so they behave like uh, soldiers in, in the yeah. group and the same is for ceramides we can see it for some uh, glycosylated ceramides. We know the same disregulation for gangliosides, for sulfatides. So honestly, everything in these uh, biochemical pathways after ceramides uh, is disregulated in the same direction. Yeah, yeah that, that, that gives you a lot of confidence, doesn't it, as well, when you mm. see that happen, yeah. And I guess also um, related to this, Lyso PC, I was interested in that one because it's also reduced in infection and sepsis and cardiovascular disease. So uh, will the sphingomyelin and the ceramides, although there's also alterations in ceramides and cardiovascular disease as well. So is that going to be an issue, the fact that changes in some of these lipids are associated with other inflammatory conditions as well? Uh, you know, we have measured so many, uh, so many healthy controls, and certainly some of these people must suffer from cardiovascular diseases just based on statistics, because mm -hmm. the exclusion criterion was only uh, the some malignant disease during the lifetime. So if these people have cardiovascular troubles, they are not excluded. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't expect the difficulties, but for sure, uh, this must be investigated during the clinical validation to focus yeah. uh, and to search for possible groups where it could be difficult to differentiate. So yeah. far, we don't see problems. Okay. Okay. So um, we have a question. Okay. Let me go to... I've got to go to the participants and then I can um, ask Dipak. So to... I, I see in the chat this guy. Yeah, it's okay. He can, now, he can now unmute himself. I've done that now. Dipak, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, Dipak, I... Sorry. There you go. Yeah. Question that 
how you normalize uh, the data using SRM um, reference? Uh -huh. So SRM, uh, we don't use SRM. <laughs> uh, we do the quantitation uh, differently. Uh, so SRM is typically used uh, in coupling with uh, triple quadrupole, but we use know. high resolution. And when you have the lipid class separation, you just separate uh, the peak of the whole class, and then you obtain uh, the joint spectrum of whole lipid class. We, we call it uh, mass spectrum, lipid class mass spectrum. And then on this spectrum, we do all the quantitation, de-isotoping, identification, and quantitation. And you ask about uh, normalization. Uh, we inject regularly uh, quality control samples, for example, pooled sample or NIST SRM, and then we measure this concentration at very regular and relatively short intervals. So then we have the possibility to normalize it uh, to this concentration regularly injected. Okay, so I uh, mean SRM with uh, this SRM NIST plasma. Uh... Uh, uh, you mean, uh, uh, yeah. sorry, uh, I was confused. Uh, you mean uh, uh, SRM has two meanings. Uh, I expected selective reaction monitoring, sorry. I understand. So, uh, so did you use some program for this normalization? Um, no, we, uh, we, we do it just manually. It's relatively simple in Excel, so that's not so complicated. You just prepare the script and then you do it. It's relatively simple. If you are interested, we, we may provide you the information. At, and by the way, it's already published in this paper in bioinformatics, so you can find it there. Okay, yeah, thank you. I also have another question, like uh, how did you analyze these 99 samples? You must have used uh, different batches and uh, normalized the batch effect. Um, for, for these 99 samples, yeah, it's just single batch. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Gwendolyn, you are next. You should be able to unmute. Okay. Can you yes. hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, I was very uh, fascinated with the results showing uh, a similar dysregulation in, in different cancers because one of my questions was if you had any... Uh, data comparing the plasma and the tissue, in this case, the pancreas. But when you show that sim different cancers have uh, similar changes, I I'm thinking if you, if you think that it can be um, like an impact of the cancer, a little bit more like systemic, no? I uh, mean that uh, because yes. it's affecting the metabolism and maybe in plasma, we can detect the presence or absence of cancer but the, to be, you know, if it is colon cancer or pancreas, it might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, we think that this is some kind of systemic, uh, systemic response because uh, if you just consider mathematically that you have early stage, it may be like one, uh, one cubic centimeter of tissue. And then obviously this small mass cannot influence like five, six liters of human blood. So we expect that this is some kind of immune response, and this is not directly related to this small tumor, that the response must be systemic. We have some hypothesis about the mechanism, uh, but uh, this is not yet verified, and at the moment um, I, cannot <laughs> I cannot disclose this hypothesis because uh, we will see uh, in the near future uh, whether we can... Uh, we, we can have just one explanation for all cancer types why these lipids are dysregulated. So it's quite a complicated biological issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's a very important result. Thank you so much. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, Samar, Hamed, you should be able to speak now. Yes, thank you so much. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm really grateful to this talk. Thank you and the speaker. We have recently uh, published uh, on the separation of lipoprotein rather than the plasma to differentiate uh, um, uh, macroalbuminuria, microalbuminuria in diabetes. And we, we showed that while the plasma 
couldn't really in in this tiny separation uh, have an effect while we did the lipoproteins. My question is, do you think if, uh, I know it's a tedious work and it's an, it's a nightmare, I know that, to separate the fractions, but do you think that would be helpful to a different, to have some effect for treatment and surgery, uh, an extra added effect on uh, the isolation of the lipodomics in the plasma? Thank you. Uh, so uh, you suggest to measure uh, lipoproteins to monitor these effects? This was the question. Yeah, may, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe some certain effects in LDL on HDL can show separation of of uh, certain sphingolipid species that they have minor changes, but they are maybe liver uh, uh, oriented or tissue oriented, but it shows in the plasma in the lipoprotein when the plasma effect is not very clear. And we showed that very elegantly in our recent publication in a very, um, because you showed fantastic results in early diagnosis and that we 100% uh, uh, needed. But also we, we if we can uh, have an effect of treatment and surgery that and, and, and prognosis, that would be elegant. And I thought like maybe that would help a little bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, honestly, I don't know the answer because we have not measured individual uh, lipoprotein fractions. We also have methodology from the past, but it was not tested in cancer research. And honestly, I don't know. I have no yeah. idea because it was never tested in my group. Yeah. So maybe good idea for future, yeah, future yeah. investigation. Uh, yeah, if, you, if you see our paper, it really helped a little bit. Post uh, it in the chat. Post a link in the chat. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I will. Thank you so I'll much. Send me, I will check it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, we're nearly done, but I've got a couple more, um, Mikhail, if that's okay. So one question was around, you mentioned that, you know, your, some of the work initially was done with serum and then there were studies with other, other cancers with plasma. Do you find that these lipids that, that are dis describing cancer versus controls, are they higher in serum? And if so, are they coming from white cells? Is that part of, you're looking at a white cell response in patients? or a platelet response in pa patients? You know that I'm quite weak in biology. We have not tested these issues. We just know that uh, profiles and dysregulations in plasma and serum are absolutely identical for these studied lipid classes. The only difference is about 20, 30% of numerical values, but yeah. profiles are absolutely identical. It mm. was shown in one of these slides. I can get there yeah. really quickly. It was shown. Oh, it? It's down here. So here you see that when you compare, for example, serum heparin plasma, so this is uh, absolutely identical profiles here. Just uh, the slope is slightly more than 1.0 because of slightly higher concentrations for serum. But concerning the relation of white cells, uh, it was not yet investigated. Mm, yeah, interesting. Okay. And also, I guess one last question then before we finish um, is relating to the clinical tests. So these are three lipids that are, are very different, I guess. And if you're going to set up a targeted assay for the three, would you envisage that to be some sort of helic approach then? Because you're going to, you know, clinically, they're going to want to be able to measure all three in one run of some description. Uh, you know, we will not measure only three lipids. I just showed three most dysregulated. But okay. we need to measure the whole profile, like 100 lipids, but we can do it within five minutes with SFC and in fully automated fashion. So yeah. we will measure much more because we need it for reliable statistical models. If you have just concentrations for free, then everything will collapse. Okay. For so statistics, we need more. Oh, okay. And so SFC is, is something that is being used or, or you can see it being used in clinical labs? Uh, the idea is uh, that uh, we will develop our own laboratory and for such relatively small countries like Czech Republic, uh, we yeah. should be hopefully capable to measure all coming samples because uh, yeah. honestly, this is not so routine measurement yeah. for every clinical laboratory. The statistical evaluation and the analytic accuracy because these differences are not huge. So if this is done by less experienced clinical laboratory, it could fail. Yeah. yeah. 
yeah, I no, can't that find that sounds like a very sensible easy. idea. Yeah, mm-hmm. very, very good. Yeah. Okay. Because no, that's if this is easy, then definitely people before us will do it. Yeah. yeah but these yeah. differences are relatively small. And mm-hmm. you could see, it, uh, for example, if you see here, that these differences are not so huge. And if you do it just for one, two, or three lipids, that's not sufficient. Yeah. For the model, you need at least like 50, 60, and then yeah. the model is stable. Yeah. Yeah. Which is complication. Yeah, great. Okay. That, that was a fascinating talk. Okay. Well, I think we've just gone six and we've uh, finished all the questions in the chat. So just to say thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, thank you for coming today and thanks to all the audience. And we'll see you next time for our next webinar, I think in a month from now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>